Hey, what are you doing here? I'm here to add a little perspective. First, let's get you closer in scale to me. Good. Whoa, 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 come on! Next, well, get away from me. What exactly are you doing? Well, there seems to be a little confusion about today's astronauts and those who went to the moon. I thought I'd offer a little perspective. So today, astronauts travel to the International Space Station. It sits in low Earth orbit, right about here. Today, astronauts have to travel about 250 miles from the Earth to get to the International Space Station. Fascinating. Can we get to the moon part, please? I'm getting there. Hold your green cheese. To get to the moon, however, astronauts had to travel about 240,000 miles away from the Earth. And they took a very specific path from the Earth to the moon where they landed. Ow! That's my eye! Once there, they set up experiments, took lots of photo and video, and picked up some rocks to bring back. While two astronauts were on the moon, a third one was in the command module orbiting around the moon. Like a little fly. Can we get these astronauts off of me? They're, they're walking all over my face. When the other two had finished on the surface, they launched into orbit and hooked up with the command module, which brought them all back to Earth. Nice. Can we make me normal head size now? I suppose. Okay. So other than the moon being a really long way away, what have we learned since the Apollo moon program? At least 30 minutes worth of stuff. This, this is 7 30. 30. Wait a minute. I don't have any hands to point at the camera. It's probably for the best. Hi, I'm Beth. And I'm Marty, and check this out. This is a Saturn V F1 engine, the same kind that took humans to the moon for the first time. Now, we are coming to you live from the National Air and Space Museum, and today we will be in our newest gallery, A New Moon Rises, which shows us views of the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbital Camera. And today, we'd like to welcome our online audience. We have actually a moon expert standing by to answer your questions. Jennifer Witten is with us, and we might take some of those questions live on the air. We'd also like to welcome our in-house audience, Whittier Education Campus. We can't wait to see what great questions you guys have to ask our experts today. Now, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter camera has been in orbit six years. It has taken some absolutely amazing images. With the LROC camera, we can see views of craters, mountains, valleys, and even the Apollo landing sites. Now, our last mission to the moon was Apollo 17 more than 40 years ago, but those landing sites are still pristine because there's no wind or rain, so we can actually still see them in place today. Now, as Marty said, the last time we were at the moon was over 40 years ago. So why are we still studying the moon? Well, we're going to answer those questions today during our broadcast, but let's start by taking a look at our only natural satellite. The regular daily and monthly rhythms of Earth's only natural satellite, the moon, have guided timekeepers for thousands of years. The moon's influence on Earth's rhythms, such as the ocean tides, has been charted by many cultures in many ages. The light areas of the moon are known as the highlands. The dark features, called maria, are impact basins that were once filled with lava. These light and dark areas represent rocks of different compositions and ages. The craters themselves, which have been preserved for billions of years, provide an impact history for the moon. Over these billions of years, the surface of the moon has been grounded to fragments ranging from huge boulders to powder.
Today, the entire moon is covered by gray powdery dust and rocky debris. Upon first seeing this landscape, astronaut Buzz Aldrin proclaimed, It was once thought that the arid, lifeless moon had not changed very much geologically for a billion years. Recent studies using the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter have shown that the moon is much more dynamic than we thought. And now I'm joined by uh, Dr. Tom Waters. He is a senior scientist here at the museum in the Center for Earth and Planetary Studies. Tom, thank you so much for being here today. Oh, my pleasure. Now, Tom, you are actually on the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter team, and right. you curated this exhibit. So do yes. you want to tell us uh, what's, what's important about the LRO mission? Well, the LRO mission had two very important goals. The first goal of the mission was actually to prepare humans to return to the moon, because as you said, we haven't been there in a long time, and we want to go back. And so to do that, we wanted to study potential landing sites, a bunch of them. We studied actually 50 different landing sites in really, really great detail using the instruments on board the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. And one of those, uh, is, those instruments is the cameras, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter cameras that take very, very high resolution pictures of the moon. So that was part of the mission. The other part of it was just to do science. We want to study the moon using these very, very high-powered cameras, these telescopic cameras, to study the moon in ways that we were not able to do before we had the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. Now, we've got some images from that. Was there anything surprising in these images that came back? There was. I mean, this is the great thing about exploring the moon, is you find things that you really didn't expect to, especially, again, with these two telescopic cameras. One of the things that we thought of about the moon was that not much had happened there. Like the moon, we thought, was pretty much a static body. Again, not much had happened for maybe a billion years. And then we started looking at these images, and we started to see features that we hadn't seen before. We actually saw very, very small blobs of material that were actually lava flows. Now, we thought the last lava flow that we thought happened on the moon was a billion years ago. When we saw these things, it was like, oh my gosh, these are really young. They have almost no craters on them. They're so young, in fact, they probably happened less than 100 million years ago, which means that the dinosaurs could have been looking up at the moon and seeing glowing red as these lavas were being flowing out onto the surface. The other thing, that we found in some of these images were these scarps, these fault scarps. They're actually formed when the crust of the moon is pushed together. And we knew that there were a couple of these. In fact, at the Apollo 17 landing site, the last landing site where Apollo astronauts visited, there was one of these fault scarps. But we didn't know how many they were until we got into orbit with the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. Now we found thousands of these faults all over the moon that are indicating that the moon is actually shrinking. Now, don't get alarmed. The moon's not going anywhere. It's not going to shrink away. It's only shrunk by a little bit. But the, me, the really exciting thing is that it's happening now. These faults aren't billions of years old. They're probably forming right now as we're sitting here. And so we didn't know that. And that's one of the things that really kind of surprised yes. you as a geologist. Absolutely. Now, when we uh, were on the moon, uh, we did collect uh, samples of rocks and we brought them back, but we needed right. sort of special tools to do that. And earlier I talked to Dr. Alan Nadell, and he showed us some of those uh, really different sort of tools that we used to, to bring the rocks back. Now I'm joined by Dr. Alan Nadell. Alan, thank you so much for being here. It's my pleasure. Behind us, there's a whole bunch of stuff in this case. Do you want to tell us a little bit about what's in here? Sure. Uh, one of the fascinating things about the lunar exploration plan, the human exploration plan in the 1960s and 70s, was how much preparation they did and how much planning they did for uh, doing the essential aspects of the missions. One of which, of course, is to collect samples. Why go there, walk around if you didn't bring anything back? And so uh, the astronauts had uh, a whole bevy of tools. The first astronauts 
basically only had the tools that they could carry attached to their belts. Uh -huh. uh, by Apollo 14, they had a little wheelbarrow with a tool carrier where they could have a bunch of tools. And of course, 15, 16, and 17, they had a lunar rover, a car. Now, I noticed that a lot of these tools have, have longer handles than we're used to here on Earth. You'll notice, first of all, that there are two various lengths. The shorter ones were used, as I said, on the earlier missions mm -hmm. when they had to carry them attached to their belts, or uh, later on they got longer. Um, there were a lot of advantages of having long. One, the suits are fairly stiff. And although they actually fell down a few times and were able to get up, basically they had to move around like that and there wasn't a whole lot of stooping. Sort of waddle. <laughs> right, there wasn't a whole lot of stooping and so they needed the extra extension. One of the things that's a little bit frustrating to us is we have no flown tools. No, really? No, why would they bring a tool back? They knew everything there was to know about a tool. Every ounce was important. And so to bring any of those back would be to sacrifice the ability to bring back another rock. There's one interesting tool here. It's called the contingency sampler. When Neil Armstrong stepped onto the moon, one of his first jobs, before he did anything else, was to use the contingency sampler to scoop up some dirt. Because if something went wrong and they said, abort, abort, climb back in, we have to go, they wanted to have at least, at least. one sample to bring back. And so the contingency sampler is one of my favorite objects. <laughs> One of the challenges was to get the samples back to Earth not contaminated by particles from hair or skin or, or any of the other things that would have been naturally uh, contaminating the atmosphere inside the spacecraft. And so uh, Union Carbide Corporation developed these Apollo Lunar Surface Return Containers, or what we call rock boxes. Rock boxes easier. <laughs> and their design was uh, to be triple sealed so that as the containers and rocks and soil were put inside, it could be closed very tightly and then to keep uh, contamination. It didn't work perfectly, but it certainly enhanced the purity of the samples that the scientists could examine when they got back to Earth. Well, thank you for explaining all these interesting things to us. I appreciate it. Well, my pleasure. Thank you. So, Tom, are we ready for some questions? Yes. Let's start with an online Absolutely. question. What other instruments beside the camera are on board the LRO? Oh, that's a great question. There's actually seven different instruments on the spacecraft. Um, I work with, again, the cameras, but one of the other instruments is designed to give us elevations. So there's a laser that actually fires pulses to the moon and then looks for them to bounce back, and that gives you a measurement of how high and low things are. There are other instruments that tell us things about the composition of the surface of the moon. So all those instruments together allow us to do some really, really great science. So we have an audience question. What is your question? How was the moon formed? How oh, was the moon formed? That's a great question. It really ties into how special the moon and the Earth connection is because the moon actually formed because an object probably the size of the Mars. I mean, big, big planetesimal. That's what we call the sort of the early building blocks of the solar system. This big planetesimal hit the Earth right when the Earth was forming. And so the debris that was left over was a mixture of that big, big object and part of the Earth's crust and mantle. So the moon is actually a part of the Earth. When it all started to form together and cooled down, that came together to form our moon. Let's take an online question. Does the moon contain water? Uh, it's a great question. The moon actually is a pretty dry place. Um, there's no atmosphere, so there's no real way for water to actually exist on the surface of the moon. And there's probably not much water in the interior of the moon, but there is possibly water in one place or some places on the moon, and that's at the poles where craters never get any sunlight. There are literally places on the moon where the sun never reaches. They get really, really cold. They're so cold that if a comet were to come by the moon, and we think this probably happened, and comets shed water, that water gets trapped in these really cold, permanently shadowed craters, 
and there may be accumulations of water ice in those craters. We don't know how much, might be a little, it might be more than a little, but that's one of the really interesting questions we're trying to figure out. Okay, and we have an audience question. What's your question? Uh, can the moon sustain life? Can the moon sustain life? Can the moon sustain life? It's a great question. Uh, the biggest problem the moon has in sustaining life is that it has no atmosphere. So it's literally, there's nothing there. So there's no air to breathe of any form or any kind. So if you're gonna live on the moon, you pretty much have to build a place. You have to build a place that can, you can bring the oxygen that you need to breathe and you have to kind of protect it. You have to put it somewhere where it's not gonna get hit by very small or even larger meteors because the moon has no protection the way the Earth does. The Earth's atmosphere protects us from a lot of small and even some fairly big objects, but the moon doesn't have that. So you wanna be careful about how you build it, but yes, you'd have to build the place to live on the moon. Thank you very much. Marty got a chance to go to his former school, South Valley Middle School in Liberty, Missouri, and he brought them a special treat. I am here at South Valley Middle School in Liberty, Missouri, and I gotta tell you, I'm really excited about this. This is my former school where I used to teach, and I actually graduated from Liberty High School a long, long time ago. Now, some of you guys were actually in my class. Raise your hand if you used to be in my class. Awesome, well today, we're gonna to be making impact craters just like on the moon. You guys are going to have marbles. You're gonna hold them up above this simulated lunar surface that has flour below it and a thin layer of cocoa on the top. We're gonna to drop the marbles in to see what happens when a crater is formed on the moon. That's pretty cool, huh? You guys ready to do this? Yeah. Let's go. Nice one, that was cool. Check that out, you've got the ejecta right over there. What do you think would happen if we dropped it from higher or lower? Make a larger impact. Okay, larger or smaller depending on how much speed it's got. Good, you wanna do that one? Yes, I would like All right, let's go right in here. Oh, now wait a minute, look at something here. Do you guys see the white there? Did you notice that that came out of the crater? Yeah. When that hits with enough force, it actually takes what's underneath and throws it out on top. And we can see that, and it's called ejecta. And what's cool about that is when the astronauts went to the moon, they were able to find ejecta from craters and pick that up. And what was, that rock that they picked up that was considered ejecta was actually from inside the moon, not just the surface. So we could study the surface of the moon by picking up just any random rock. But if we picked one up that had come from inside a crater, we knew we had a rock from inside the moon. We're gonna try something different now. I want you to drop another one. And this one I want you to drop right here. Can you do that? Yep. Okay, now we've got two craters. This one kinda of got messed up, didn't it? So can we tell which one's newer? The one that's yes. less deformed. Exactly, so when we look at the moon now, we can see that craters that are fully formed are probably newer than ones that maybe have an overlap in them. So you can actually tell ages of craters on the moon by how they overlap other craters. You guys did a great job making craters on the surface of the moon, but I thought it might be kind of cool if we took an opportunity to see something actually from the moon. So what I have with me today from our friends at NASA, I brought actual uh, moon rocks. Whoa. And you guys are gonna get a chance to look at these up close today. You guys ready? Yeah. Let's do it. You guys got an opportunity to make craters on the surface of the moon and see what we can learn by actually looking at the moon. And then you guys got an opportunity to actually hold some moon rocks. Was that pretty cool? Yeah. You guys did crater than I ever thought you would. Nice work. <laughs> We're now joined by Pris Strain, the 
curator for the moon rocks we have on display here in the museum. Thank you so much for talking with us today. Oh, I'm happy to be here. And we're standing here in front of images of the Apollo landing sites where the astronauts actually were able to pick up the rocks and bring them back. Can you tell us about the rocks that we have on display here? Oh, yes. We have a, a rock from Apollo 15 that was collected by astronaut Dave Scott, and it's 3.3 billion years old. Then we also have an uh, ancient rock from the Lunar Highlands, and it's 4.36 billion years old. Moon rocks are really old. We also have two samples from Apollo 17, which were collected by the astronauts Jack Schmidt and Gene Cernan. We have a rock, and we also have a sample of lunar soil. Outstanding. So visitors to the museum can actually come here and see those. That's right. All right. Now, guys, on the video that we watched, those students got a chance to actually hold moon rocks. That was pretty cool, wasn't it? Yes. All right, well, I've got a surprise for you. Officer, could you come here, please? Thank you. All right. Let's see what's in this case here. So what I've brought in are wow. actual moon rocks that you guys are going to get a chance to look at. Now, what I think is really cool about this lunar sample disk is that this disk holds uh, samples from four different manned missions to the moon, Apollos 14, 15, 16, and 17. So in this disk, it represents four times that man went to the moon. And I'm going to give you guys a chance to actually look at these. So I'm going to hand that to you, and you guys can take the, the magnifying glasses and check that out. Now, Chris, you were telling me earlier that this sample actually tells the story of the moon. How is that? Oh, well, the lunar rocks are very, very old. So it's a way of looking back through time and learning about the earliest history of the moon. And the first one that we're going to talk about is anorthosite. Mm -hmm. What does that tell us? That's right. And anorthosite is a, um, a light-colored rock that's made up almost entirely of just one mineral, which has a kind of funny name. It's called plagioclase feldspar, and that's a common rock-forming mineral on the Earth. And the, uh, the anorthosites are uh, uh, found very much in the ancient lunar highlands. And so that tells us about the development of the early lunar crust. Okay, and, then, uh, and actually it's light colored, so when we go out and look up at the moon at night and we see that it's got light areas and dark areas, those light areas, we're actually seeing anorthosite just like these guys are holding right now. That's right. That's really cool. Now, there's also a couple other kinds of rocks in there that help tell that story. Another rock we have is called a breccia, and that's an Italian word. And it means a rock that's made up of irregularly shaped fragments of other rocks. And on the moon, breccias are just smashed up, beat up rocks that uh, were little pieces of other rocks are all smashed together. And that tells us about the violent early history of the moon uh, when it was bombarded by meteors and asteroids and maybe comets. And you see all the craters on the moon, you can see that that, that was a, a very heavy bombardment of the surface. And we can read that in the rock. Very violent, it sounds like. Mm -hmm. And how about the third one? The third one is called a basalt, and that's a dark colored. Um, igneous rock, and igneous means that it uh, f formed from melted material that uh, cooled and hardened, and uh, the basalts form the very flat lowland plains on the moon. And an interesting thing about lunar basalts is that lunar basalts have more titanium than earth basalts. Oh, wow. Now, teachers, if you think this is pretty cool, you can actually become lunar rock certified to check out this lunar sample disk, and NASA will send it to you, and the best part is it's free to use in your classroom. Now, visitors that come to the museum have an opportunity to do something that I think is incredibly cool. They can actually touch a moon rock. Tell us about that. Yes, the touch rock that we have at the museum was collected on Apollo 17, and it's a, it's a basalt. And when you look at it, maybe it looks kind of plain to you, but when you think about it, it's a really amazing rock. It's 3.8 billion years old, and it was exposed on the surface of the moon about 100 million to 125 million years ago, probably by a crater impact. And it sat there waiting until 1972, when astronaut Jack Schmidt, who was the only professional geologist who was an astronaut who went to the moon, he picked it up and brought it back to Earth. And then in 1976, it found a home here in the museum so you can come and touch a piece of another world. That's so cool that visitors can come touch a piece of another world. Now, when Neil Armstrong took the first steps on the surface of the moon, he was wearing a spacesuit, and that spacesuit is currently in conservation at the Stephen F. Udvar Hazy Center, and I had a chance to talk to one of the conservators about how they're dealing with the moon dust still on that suit. Check this out. 
I'm joined by Lisa Young, a conservative here at the National Air and Space Museum, and we are in the conservation lab at the Stephen F. Udvar Hazy Center. In front of us is Neil Armstrong's spacesuit that he wore when he took the first step on the moon. Now, this is still covered in moon dust, right? Yep. What can you tell us about that moon dust? Uh, the moon dust is mostly on the bottom half of the suit. You can see it where it's discolored to a little bit darker gray. And the moon dust is made of grains of soil or minerals that are very sharp and angular. There's no atmosphere on the moon, so the grains and particles of sand don't get worn down. And they cut into the suit fabrics and have embedded themselves between the fibers of the textile. And it's not just one type of grain of moon dust, right? Right. Scientists have identified six different types of grains, and um, you can see them under the microscope pretty clearly. And we can see them here on the surface of the suit. And so when you're conserving this suit to eventually go back on public display and to keep it for generations to come, you have to think about that moon dust in your work, don't you? Right. There's not, we don't really want to clean off the moon dust. It doesn't come off easily, but there is other types of dust that have gotten onto the suit. So we use special techniques to make sure that the moon dust will remain on the fabric and that we get off unwanted dust from uh, storage and display. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for talking to us today. Sure. I'm back with Tom and Pris. Now, we've taken a look at a lot of different things today about the moon. Why do we still study it? Well, it, the moon is very special. I mean, it's our closest neighbor in the solar system. But it also has this, again, very special connection to the Earth. The moon really has kind of a stabilizing influence on the Earth. And you know it as the tides. You see the influence by the tidal rise and fall of water. Actually, the Earth does the same thing to the moon. In fact, it's doing it now. Instead of raising tides on the moon, it raises kind of a solid body tide, not a water tide, because there's no water on the moon. But that's actually influencing how the moon is developing with these young faults that we were talking about that are still forming, the earth is actually influencing how those faults form. And even though the rocks were brought back from the moon over 40 years ago, Chris, people are still studying those, aren't they? Oh, that's right. Every year NASA still hands out samples to scientists who want to study the moon. And we're still learning new things about the composition of the rock. And that's because a lot of it, technology just keeps getting better. That's right. Okay, so let's take a couple more questions. We have an online question first. How are moon rocks and Mars rocks similar or different? Well, moon rocks formed uh, in an environment that had little or no water, uh, as we've talked about before. Uh, on Mars, there's evidence that there was lots of water at one time. So on the moon, uh, we don't have a whole class of rocks that you find on Mars and the Earth, which are the sedimentary rocks, which are rocks that form uh, by depositing in water. Okay, so uh, we have an audience question. What's your question? Why is the moon black and white? Why is the moon black and white? Oh, well, when we look at the moon and we see the, the white areas are the highland areas, and there, it's because they're made up of white rocks and light colored rocks, like the anorthosite that we talked about before. And the dark colored areas are made up of dark rocks, like the basalt that we talked about before. So there aren't any trees or oceans, we're just looking at... No, just <laughs> rocks. Looking, looking and at rocks. pretty old ones too. Okay, so let's go to an online question. Uh, have we found any new materials that are present on the moon? Well, we did find some um, uh, new minerals on the moon. Uh, and we found that they were minerals that were formed at high pressures. And this comes from all the cratering on the moon and all the bombardment on the moon that creates high pressures in the rocks and can help form new minerals. Um, they found a new mineral. It was called Armalcolite, which was named after Armstrong, Aldrin, and Collins, <laughs> the Apollo 11 astronauts, which we hadn't known of before, but later found at an impact crater on the Earth. Um, there was also a, a mineral called Tranquilityite, and one with a really strange name, uh, P-1-2-3-4-5-6-7-8-9-10-11-12-13-14-15-16-17-18-19-20-21-22-23-24-25-26-27-28-29-30-31-32-33-34-35-36-37-38-39
Pyrox Ferroite. Well, I want to thank you two both for being here today. That's all the time we have. I also want to thank the International Titanium Association. And this is our last show uh, of the school season. We'll pick up again in September. We've got some really exciting topics. Let's give you a little look. Thanks so much for watching today. We hope to see you in September. That was really great.